like getting charter boards in every closet. Try that. Try that. Try that. Is it safe to get a soda changer? Anybody else have got any?
Do we have more maple leaves than more? <coughs> People come and bag up our leaves today. So the kids were able to be outdoors all, all week and play in the leaves and do all that fun fall stuff before the killing frost comes that you got to get ready today. Um, can you find art of worship? Can you back up the And the, oh boy, that is loud, isn't it? So I turned this one down on the side. The far one.
thank you that you make us complete. Please help us to remember that. Please be there for us in those times that you need to cut your hands right around us and say, I am going to make you complete. And we lift up this service to you today, and we lift up the whole day because it's been a little bit of a rough start with technology this morning. So we ask that you would order our day, provide for our every need, and encourage us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Um, this is usually you know that we uh, light this candle. Okay, come on, guys. We light this candle here for all our soldiers. I don't believe that your life for not just our soldiers, their families, our Christian soldiers, and our Christian families too. Because there are all over the world. Being in heaven's way, it doesn't matter if you're a uh, soldier, Sherry, Marine, any of them, or even just one of our Christian families out there who preach in the world, they're all in danger all the time. Because there's people out there who just don't like this at all. And uh, we pray. Dear Lord, take care of all our soldiers, their families at home, and keep them safe, Lord. And all our Christian family that's overseas too, passing the word. Of the Lord to everyone that can get here because they're, they're still in the same danger, Lord. Everybody else is probably over there and they, their lives are in danger too, but they're willing to do that just like soldiers. Put themselves out there to do the right thing. And we pray for them today, all in your glorious name. Amen. Um, on Tuesday, we have at 11 o'clock a senior lunch and get together. Um, if you are planning to come and you're a senior, get with Roger or the pastor so that you can get the lunch ordered. On Wednesday, we have our 645 is our prayer meeting and our Bible study. So if you have any prayers you want, get with either the pastor or one of the deacons. Uh, next Sunday, we have our adult Sunday school, and we also have our board meeting. And uh, next Sunday is Act 7, 41 through 60. October 19th is our ladies' brunch at 10.30. Also, um, at the end of October, the end of this month, we will be putting up our hats, gloves, and mittens and boots. And if we can get at least one per each family out of the church, if we can afford it, one heavy pair of mittens or gloves that's waterproof for the kids. That's about it. Yes. Yeah. I have a point to kind of like go with some of the announcement about the Women's Brunch. I've changed the dates three times, so a friend told me last night, we know that the 19th is going to be a long weekend, and she was talking about the leaving out of the area. But if those of you that's here, please support it. I'm planning on making this, I, I'm planning on, I'm not going to bring it to the floor, just doing it for Mother's Day from now on, because that's probably getting so, trying to get everyone track, trying to find someone to speak and all that. It's really been. Um, hard, and I'm going to some other family things that I'm going through every day, so I kind of like have to struggle this year. So, um, but it's, it's fall, and so I want to kind of like concentrate on things like casseroles, uh, soups, um, you know, um, chili, things like that. So, the people that, that in this church, and I'll ask some other people to do the same, to I know you may not be the best with all those ingredients. But if you could bring like a casserole dish, things that you eat in the fall and the winter that kind of like um, comfort foods like chilies, you know, you can, you can make um, a chicken chili or a vanilla type of chili. Um, if you could do that, I would appreciate it and let your, your friends and your family know that we are having um, the women's brunch on the 10th, on the 19th at um, 1030. I would appreciate it. Also, Annette, women, your lonely ladies, whoever's interested, if
If I can have two gentlemen, two gentlemen come forward for a uh, offering, offering. You know what? When it comes to an offering, it can come in different ways, in many ways. I'm going to give you a little story about what. Uh, it's been six months since I've towed my car. I've been in, in, the in and out of the hospital a lot of, a lot of times si since. With severe back pain, although the pain had been begun to subside, my recovery forced me to use all my sick time and vacation time for a year. But this morning, my boss, who is usually all business and pretty hard on everyone, called me into her office and told me that she talked to HR and donated five days of her own unused vacation leave. So I would get, still get paid when I go out to visit my family for Christmas. That's just another way you could give to the Lord. But that, let's pray. Lord, in moments of despair, we turn to you as our source of hope and renewal. Lift our spirit from the depths of discouragement and infuse in our hearts with your unwavering hope. Help us to embrace each day as, as, as a fresh start, filled with new possibilities, renewed by faith in you, in your goodness and grace. Remind us that you are always working for us. Working for us and for the good. Amen. comment in our Sunday school. You guys miss out when you don't get here for Sunday school class. We had a nice discussion in Sunday school, including one little comment about uh, some days it's hard to remember God's promise that all things work together for good. Some things that come into our life don't feel very good to us. God says he's going to take that, whatever it was, and make it a blessing to us in some way. I'm glad of that promise, because boy, we need that one all the time. All right. Let me see. Do I have anything I should announce before we get started? Well, I will tell you to make sure you're turning to Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 7 today again. One thing I should mention is this concert that's coming up over at Parkside Bible Church. Sunday, October 20th at 6 p.m. I do not know of these singers, though I mentioned that they are um, from the Gaither Brothers 
homecoming team, so they, I assume they're probably good. <laughs> I would assume they're probably really good. Um, so if any of you are interested in a Christian concert, that will be out at Parkside on the 20th. That will be three weeks from today. Mm. Two weeks from today. Okay. I think the only other thing I want to do right now is just ask you guys, as I always do, look around. We're missing some people today. Who do we need need to be praying for, and do we know why they're missing if they are? Rose. Rose and Brett are not here. I had a message from her this morning that Brett is not feeling good. He's in quite a bit of pain. So we need to be praying for them. Who else do you Barbara, know? Charlie, Barb and Charlie Petty are not here. I assume that's still because of her shoulder surgery, uh, recovering from that. But I will call them and find out. And make sure that we're praying for them. Fran and his family. Fran. Fran and the, ch the children. Grandchildren. <laughs> um, yes, I do not know why. Does anybody else have any word on Fran? All right. I talked to her early in this last week and she seemed to be doing okay then so I'll be in touch with her soon. Just make sure things are okay. Yeah. I know she was having a lot of trouble with one flight so we'll see. Janet. Yeah, and Janet and Carl are not here. They're that packing up at camp and spending some time with their daughter and grandkids. Packing up at camp and their daughter? And grandkids. And her husband came as well. Ah. Art. Art is not with us. I had a message from him just before service started that, uh, you know, of course, first Sunday of the month he works with that breakfast program up at Governor, uh, providing breakfast for those who need it. And he says, uh, we're pretty busy. I don't know if I'll make it. <laughs> uh, apparently, they kept him up there quite a while working on that. Let's see. And of course, we know Gary isn't here, and we know why. He's still on his uh, six weeks of bed rest, or whatever is the proper term is for it. And I can imagine getting impatient, so he'll probably need a lot of prayer. I think that's a good idea, but I wouldn't want to guarantee that's what he's doing. <laughs> he should be. Uh, let's see, who else is in here? Katina is in here. Yeah, Katina and the kids are not here because she sent me a message this morning that she's not feeling very well. So they're going to stay home and not give it to anybody else. I don't know about Athena and Ashmiel. I'll have to call them. Excellent. Is that, yeah, that's a load right there. There's quite a few of them. I knew just looking around, we had a lot of missing people, but. All right, so we need to be praying for these folks through the week. Um, being with family, of course, that's a, that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> other, other than that, uh, well, arts ministry is good. But these others, if we're not sure, then I hope it's not illness, but we'll check in and find out and just be praying that things are well. Um, anything else? I think that's it. All right, let's take a minute to pray. God, as I come to you today, there's a whole lot of things on my heart and mind and I'm sure on each person here. Seems like we've got <laughs> this world going crazy around us, to be putting it simply. One of the things that obviously comes to mind is all the natural disasters, hurricanes and fires and everything else lately. I know, Lord God, that you're in charge of all of that too. These things can't happen without your allowing it. But Lord, sometimes we have no idea why. And we get kind of uh, worried. You are the master of all of it. There's still a whole lot of people down there in North Carolina and Tennessee and all the way down 
uh, dealing with the aftermath of the flooding and everything from the Hurricane Katrina. And now I'm told there's another hurricane that's supposed to hit there this week. Uh, you know what you're doing. And we do thank you that you're in charge, that you keep, that you're controlling what happens around us. God, we need your help, and we know that our friends and relatives and anybody down there that's going through all of this definitely needs your help. God, be there. Be there. Be taking care of them under the circumstances. Be with our military. And again, we had another rocket attack out in uh, our military bases in the Middle East. You know about the whole situation there in Israel and with the surrounding Arab countries. Definitely something for us to be concerned about if it wasn't for you. Because you know what's going on. And you will control what happens. And you promised that you will take care of them and of your people, wherever they are. Lord, I do pray for our military that are out there in harm's way. Not just there, in several other places in this world, too. I pray for the Christians who are facing persecution in a whole bunch of areas in our world. Some that are being, that are really facing persecution to the point of being killed for their faith. God, you know those circumstances too, and you know each person there, you know what's needed. Thank you, God, for your mercy and your grace that you are watching over these folks, even though it's not obvious to us. You do so many things that we don't know anything about, and I praise you for it. I know you work in our lives in so many ways that we don't even realize, protecting us from things that could have happened and you keep it from happening. We are so glad, Lord, that you do love us. Don't understand why, but I'm so grateful that you do. Lord, today I want to thank you for this new day and whatever is going to be happening in it. I thank you for the fact that we're here, that we are well enough to be able to join together around your word, sing your praises, rejoice in a wonderful God. I ask you, my God, to bless this time together, to use it, as your Holy Spirit works in our hearts to bring us closer to you, closer to what you want us to be as well. And I just thank you for all the different ways that you show your love to us. In Christ's name, amen. And now, Acts chapter 6. And for anybody that isn't aware of what this is all about, we're doing a study through the book of Acts. We got this far, and this is a chapter that is taking us a little time to get through because it is a message, a sermon, though he wouldn't have called it that. Stephen, a Christian member of the church there in Jerusalem, has been out witnessing for the Lord the Jewish synagogue one of them that he was spending some time with, the leaders have discovered that they can't debate with him because God gives them the answers and he, they can't win an argument with him. And so instead, they, uh, I like the way the word puts it, they hire people to falsely testify against him that he's been blaspheming God and saying things against the Jewish religion. Uh, perjurers, um, the Bible uses a term for them, which basically means somebody who's been bribed to lie. <laughs> Pretty simple. And uh, they bring him before the council, and they are accusing him of blasphemy and of false prophecy, and uh, uh, both of which are punishable by death. And I love chapter 7 starts, then said the high priest, Are these things so? Asking Stephen. 
Did you do all these things? Now you and me, as I said when we started looking at this earlier, he's going to say, if, if it was me and the judge that I'm standing before asked me if I've done these things I'm accused of, which I didn't, my first answer would be no. <laughs> didn't do any of those things. They're lying. Something like that, you know. He doesn't say that. We looked at chapter 7. Actually, that's, we're going to be finishing. In, well, we're going to be spending part of our time in chapter 7. Um, I was, well, we're going to spend all of our time in part of chapter 7 today. Because we're going to look at some of the rest of his response. It, we looked at last week where he responded to the high priest and he said, <coughs> he gives some history lesson. I don't know how to put it in a few words. He just basically said, it goes right back to Abraham, the father of the Jewish people. <coughs> and he says, do you remember when God appeared to Abraham and made him all these promises? And then he starts talking about the promises and how God kept all of his promises, but Abraham and the Jewish people didn't keep theirs. <laughs> they didn't live up to him by any means. And then we're going to, how far down did I get? We better stop. We were talking about how, we talked about Joseph. We talked about how God had prophesied even back to Abraham, which is five generations before Joseph, told him that, told Abraham, that later on, your people, your descendants, are going to end up going down to Egypt and being slaves there. And then I'm going to call them back out. After they've been there 400 years, he even specifies the time. <laughs> he said, you're going to spend 400 years there. Then I'm going to call them back out. And bring them back to this land that I promised you I would give them. I love God's promises and how he says, in this case, he gives them even the timing. But he says, I told you I was going to do it. But there's going to be this problem in between. Doesn't that sound like a lot of the Old Testament prophets when they give a message to the people of Israel later on? <laughs> he'll go talking through the prophets. He'll tell them, I promised you that I'm going to do such and such. But because of your sin, i got to do this first. <laughs> You're going to spend 70 years in Babylon as uh, slaves. <laughs> Things like that. Yeah. But he tells them, you might as well know what I'm going to do. Here it is. Unless you repent, this is going to happen. Well, that's what he's doing way back here. And this is what Stephen is reminding them of. This isn't really a defense against the charge, is it? But he's going to make a point. And he's, getting to a, he's kind of making it as he goes. He keeps throwing in these little comments about how, and then you didn't obey God and he had to do something. <laughs> But that's going to be his final point, is you're still not obeying God. Where did I leave off? We ought to go down to where it's talking about Moses. Verse 20 of chapter 7. Well, actually, I better back up to verse 18, because we left off talking about how Joseph had brought all of the family of his father's household down to Egypt to live during that famine kept them alive. That's how they ended up in Egypt for 400 years. And now he's going to jump ahead and talk about how they got out of Egypt. And that starts with verse 19. Or 18? Yes, 18. Talks about how the people of uh, the Jewish people, Abraham's descendants, came down to Egypt till another king arose who knew not Joseph. That same dealt subtly with our people. Sneakily. He said, simply, and evil entreated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end that they might not live. You may remember that. Um, at the third pharaoh, after the time of Joseph, I think it was, he passed the law that if a Jewish mother had a girl, child, that was fine. But if they had a son, he was to be killed. 
Why do you think he did that? Well, think about it. Say again. He did, and they considered the Jewish people as a whole a threat because they were multiplying rapidly. And But the idea was, if you wipe out all the males, who are the females going to marry? They're going to marry the Egyptians. And there will be no more Jews. <laughs> and it'll be, they'll all come down the family line of the Egyptians now. You know what? Satan has been trying to wipe out the Jewish race from the beginning of uh, the first proof of the, uh, the first prophecy of the Messiah. He's used several different ways. Do you remember in the book of Esther, a man by the name of Haman? He was the uh, second in command in Persia, which ruled over the Jews at that time. And so he passed a law that on a certain date, Everybody that gets to kill any Jews they want to. <laughs> Planning to wipe out the Jewish race. Satan does not, did not want the Messiah to come. He knew the promises. Satan knows the word of God as well as we do. Better. And uh, he knew the promise that through the Jewish lion, there was going to be a Messiah who was going to destroy him. And so he tried several times through the Old Testament to wipe out the Jews. Of course, God didn't allow it. But this is one, those are two of those examples right there. And you know what? He still hates the Jews. And the Bible says he, that Satan will be persecuting the Jewish race, uh, Jewish nation as such, or the Jewish race as a people, right up through the tribulation period, right until Christ comes back. Um, as we look at the Middle East right now and see every nation round about Israel trying to destroy them, yeah, uh-huh, that hasn't changed over the years, has it? And of course, even if you look back a little bit before most of our time, Hitler was yeah, doing his best to wipe out the Jewish race. The Holocaust. There's so many instances of that. There was another one back in Persia, way back. But uh, it, it, if you're looking in the Bible or if you're looking in history, we see over and over again. Of course, Satan wants to wipe out the line of the Messiah. Of course, Christ has already come, fulfilled every one of those promises. So Satan still hates the Jews because they're the ones that he came to. Anyway, that's what this deal in Egypt was about, to destroy the Jewish race, Satan's attempt. Of course, as I said, God didn't allow it. I got to hurry up. <laughs> I love talking about God's word, but it seems like the clock was by all of that. So, we get a whole bunch of new Jewish king or new Egyptian kings ruling over the Jews, try to wipe them out. Then we get to Moses, verse 20, in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house for three months. I'm going to read through all of this about Moses down to a certain point and then we'll talk about it. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and he was mighty in words and deeds. And when he was a full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God, by his hand, would deliver them. But they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, as they fought, and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who may be a ruler and a judge over us? Will you kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. 
And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. Yeah, I think all of us would. And as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled, and dared not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is all ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt. I have heard their groaning, and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who may be a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them up after he had showed them wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. I'm going to stop there because I doubt I'll get any farther than that today. <laughs> you all know the story of Moses, I think, pretty well. Moses... a Hebrew, a Jew, uh, actually of uh, the line of Levi, uh, which eventually became the priestly class. They, he was born, kept by his parents for three months. When he got to the point where it couldn't really be hidden any longer because of his, I imagine by then he could cry pretty loud. Uh, she knew she had to do something she was supposed to have murdered him the day he was born, of course. She didn't do that. And uh, so his parents decided to not to kill him and not to just put him out in the wilderness, which would have, where he would have died anyway. They decided to do something that would put it in God's hand. Put him in a basket and floated him down the river Nile. To you or me, that may seem kind of weird, but I could think it was just that. They were saying, okay, he's still alive. God, what are you going to do with him? And of course, we know Pharaoh's daughter finds him, takes him into the palace, and he's adopted as Pharaoh's grandson. So raised in the palace. I love the way it describes him as an adult. Verse 22, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He was trained up there in the palace as if he was an Egyptian prince. He was taught, and the Egyptians at that time were probably the most scientifically advanced of anybody. Uh, so he was taught by the best advisors and teachers around. And then it says he was mighty in words and in deeds. He was raised as a prince of Egypt. Theoretically, if he had, of course, as God arranged it, done something different, he probably would have ended up as the pharaoh of Egypt if he had just left it in the hands of man. Of course, God wasn't going to do that. Um, Moses, I didn't mention that pharaoh's daughter adopted him. <laughs> But she needed somebody to be a nurse for him, to breastfeed him. And God arranged it so beautifully that his mother was available. <laughs> so his mother raised him for the first, uh, up until the time he was weaned. And uh, so he knew <coughs> that who his real family was. But he, he was raised in the uh, palace, treated as an Egyptian prince. Um, but when he's 40 years old, he decides, I need to find out what's really going on with my people. We don't have any idea why, but except for one little comment back there, which I read. Did you notice it says that he thought that the Jews would realize that he was the one that God was going to use to bring them out? He thought they would understand that. Obviously, God had 
made it plain to him somehow, either in a direct appearance, vision, something or other. But Moses knew what his job was supposed to be. However, remember some people that are mentioned in the Bible, and of course, you and me sometimes too, that get impatient with God's plans and his timing and try to hurry things along, help God along. Remember uh, Sarah and Abraham? <laughs> there are many other examples in the scripture about that. Well, Moses was out to check on how things are going with the Jewish people. Sees an Egyptian guard beating a Jewish man and decides, I'm going to get started on helping him out. So he kills the Egyptian. Um, wasn't God's plan yet. Not that way, that's for sure. So now, he goes out the next day, he thinks everything's fine, he buries the Egyptian in the sand, nobody saw it except him and the Jewish guy that he saved. So he goes out the next day and here's two Jewish people arguing. I don't know what was going on, but he just said one of them was doing something wrong to the other. So Moses says, stop it. You guys are brothers. You guys are related. You shouldn't be fighting. And the guy that was doing the wrong, whatever it was, looks at him and says, who made you a judge? You're going to kill me like you did the Egyptian? I can just see Moses at that moment realizing, how did he know about that? People are talking. <laughs> <laughs> and what would it mean for Moses, even though he was Pharaoh's adopted grandson, he was a Jew, and he had just he had killed one of the Egyptian guards. That's a death sentence, <laughs> and he knew it, so he ran away quick. <laughs> he was smart about that. Often I look at Moses' life and I think about it. Interesting way God raises up people to do his work. Well, first of all, he doesn't choose people that you and I would choose as being the perfect representative for him, for God. <laughs> he chooses people that are just as human and just as dumb as you and me. He uh, chooses people that make mistakes. Because there ain't any other kind. I love, who was it? I think it was Billy Graham, but I'm not sure, made the comment that uh, God uses sinners to accomplish his purpose. So there ain't any other kind. <laughs> that's you and me. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's Moses too. Very human, very impetuous, impulsive, whatever the right word is. Um, but he learned to be a good servant for God. But here, what I've started to say about his training, how God trained him to be the leader he needed to be, he spent 40 years in the palace learning everything that the Egyptians knew. He was very well educated. He was treated as part of the king's household, so I'm sure he had the best food, the best clothing, everything like that. That might be good training for a leader in a lot of ways. But there was a problem. He wasn't an Egyptian prince. That wasn't his purpose. So now he spends how long out as a shepherd because of his killing that guy? Anybody know how long he spent hiding up in the uh, in the northern part of the what eventually became the promised land? 40 years. 40 years more. Moses' life breaks into three 40-year periods. First 40 years as a prince in Egypt, enjoying all of the luxury. The next 40 years living as a shepherd out in the wilderness, in the desert, raising sheep, chasing sheep around. Um, quite a change from what he's been doing. And then, 
40 years leading the people of Israel through that, some of that same territory. Um, God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? Strange sense of humor from our point of view sometimes, but he needed the training, all of the wisdom and everything that he learned from the Egyptians, but he also needed to learn how to live not as a pampered child, but as a guy out in the woods, out in the wilderness, out in the deserts, wherever he took those sheep. They then to learn to do what a shepherd does, to lead the sheep properly, to take them where they need to go. And have any of you ever worked with sheep? They're not exactly easy to work with. <laughs> they like to wander off. Sounds like people, doesn't it? Sounds like you and me. I love the fact that in the New, in the New Testament, so often, you know, even in the Old Testament too, God refers to his people as the sheep of his pasture. Yeah. That's not a compliment. <laughs> like them, we have a tendency to wander off from where we're supposed to be. Go our own way. Here we see Moses. Man, did he ever get a training course, basic training from God for 40 years pretty easy life. 40 years that was not an easy life at all. And then God says, okay, now you're ready. Now I can use you. What's your life been like? I don't know if you've had an easy life or a harder life than most. Um, if it's been, I know all of us have had enough trouble. So that's not a question. That tells us that. He doesn't tell us that this life's going to be easy. He tells us the exact opposite. And then he says, if you're trying to follow me, it's going to be harder. <laughs> Don't you like these? There are preachers that teach. But once you come to the Lord Jesus, give your life to him, everything goes easy. They're not reading the same Bible I am. Because they don't say that. <laughs> It says that once you start trying to live for the Lord, Satan starts trying to make sure you don't. And starts giving you some hardships. It's that simple. You don't make it easy, but the promise is God says that he'll be with you through every one of those problems and that he'll give you a blessing from that problem. It won't be just a hard time, it'll be a blessing in that hard time. That he blesses us every every day, whether we're seeing it or not. Sometimes it's hard for us to recognize it. Sometimes it's hard for us to see it. As we said about that verse, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them that love God. When I look at some of the things that happen in my life or happen in your lives, they sure don't look good while we're going through them. But he says, I'm going to make that a blessing to you. And he does. He produces something in that action, in that situation. And you see the blessings come through. And you know what? i got to quit if we're going to do a communion service today. <laughs> and the Lord has a way of using my time up in a hurry, it seems like. And yet I love talking about this, the Word of God. There is so much there. And over and over again, we see how God blesses. Moses, when he ran away from this, guy, uh, this situation where he knew he had killed a man and now he hadn't taken it very good, people knew about it. He knew that he was under death sentence as soon as the Pharaoh heard about it. So he's on the run. I'll bet he wasn't feeling very good about things at that point. Especially considering the 40 years of luxury he'd been living in. And now, oh, here I go. But you know what? God was using it to make him the man he needed to be. What's he doing in your life? Are you on one of the easy parts? Or are you on one of the parts that gets kind of rocky? I don't know. We all have both. Um, but 
whichever one we're on, God's right there with us. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And he'll carry you through and help you and bless you. Sometimes I think the easy times are more difficult to keep our eyes on God than during the hard times. Because during the hard times, we usually get to the point where we realize, oh, Lord, I need your help a lot right now. But when everything's going good, we have a tendency to think, look how great I'm doing. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> but that's human nature, too. And so we have to be careful about that. Kind of like the simple idea that every night, or sometime during every day, take time to think about, okay, how things go today. Thank you, God, for all the good things. And where I messed up, help me to fix it and keep on going. Because <laughs> we sure need that. There is one place where David prays in one of the Psalms, something that is a scary prayer in a way, where he says, Lord, show me my heart and what I'm really like. And I'm not sure I want to see that some days because I know what my heart is really like. I'm still a selfish human being so with a human nature that likes to go my own way. And that's what every one of us is until God takes us home to heaven and changes us. Um, that nature is still there. But we have to be careful every day. I said I was going to stop. <laughs> I will. I'll stop this part. We're going to look at the communion service, our time thinking about what Christ did for us on the cross. That is, that's not the place I want to be. Wrong marker. <laughs> I'm still absolutely just as prone to mistakes as anybody else. You know that. We're going to be in Mark. We're going to be reading where at that last night, just before he was arrested, Jesus met with the disciples. And that's where he instituted this communion service that we call it. With the breaking of the bread and the giving of the wine, and we use juice, to commemorate something that, as he's doing it with the disciples, hadn't even happened yet. He says, this is going to be your remembrance of my death on the cross, which is about to happen. It must have been an interesting evening for them because he had just told them that all of this was going to happen. And it's going to happen tonight and tomorrow. <laughs> but it starts tonight with the arrest. And uh, they were pretty scared, pretty worried. But he says, this is your way of remembering and bringing it back to mind. So before I do anything else, I'll get things set up here. All right, and we'll do this as we have been doing lately. I'll ask a couple of our men to come and to distribute these elements to each and every person. Whether you take them or not is up to you. There are no requirements biblically except the idea that if you're not saved, if you haven't asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior, it really has no purpose for you. So that's just totally... Uh, irrelevant to you, and but it's up to you. You can partake. We offer the elements to everybody and leave it up to you whether you're going to partake. There is one thing that is mentioned several times in the scriptures, and that is if you aren't right with the Lord, if you know you've got some sin in your life that you haven't confessed and asked him to forgive, do that before you partake. Because this is supposed to be between you and the Lord as a sign of your fidelity to him and of your trust in him. 
So you should be right with him first. So if there's any problem in your life, whoever, pray about it before you get going here. Go back to the Lord for forgiveness. As I said, this just celebrates, reminds us of Christ's death on the cross. And all of you know about the crucifixion and the resurrection. You know that Christ was nailed to a cross, died on the cross for our sins, not for his. He didn't have any sin. He died and took our punishment so that we can have forgiveness through his righteousness. It's simply easily pointed out over and over in the scriptures that none of us are good enough to get to heaven on our own because we've all sinned. And that's the God's criteria is holiness without sin whatsoever. So none of us can get to heaven on that one. The only way we can, as Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's exactly what this is all about. He took our place, he took our punishment, and now we can go to him and receive forgiveness and be washed clean of our sins because of what he did for us. Okay, we got everybody down? Good. All right, in Mark, as you know, that the, the scriptures give us four different places where it describes what took place that night. I'm going to use Mark this time. And it says, And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave it to them. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body. So we use the bread as they did as a reminder of his body broken for us. Let's part it. And then he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. Then he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Let's mark it. Of course, a simple reminder, which you guys obviously know, as he's telling the disciples this that night before he's arrested. It hadn't happened yet. His body hadn't been broken yet. His blood hadn't been shed yet. But he's saying this is going to be a way of remembering. And he tells them to do it from then on. As a way of remembrance. You and I need reminders. Well, then he adds something that I love after they have their ceremony. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of this vine until the day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And another um, place where it's talking about this, it phrases it a little differently. It says that he would not drink it again until he drinks it new with us in heaven. I like that. Someday that we'll partake of a communion service if we have asked Christ to be our Savior. We'll partake of a communion service like this, but in heaven. Yeah, well, I bet I don't know what it'll be like, but I'm looking forward to it. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, as we close out this service today, I thank you so much for what you have done for us. For the fact that there is all the promises of the Messiah, and then we see how Christ fulfilled every single promise, that you provided a way of salvation, that he took upon himself the punishment for our sins and gave us a way to be right with you through his righteousness. Heavenly Father, there's no way to say thank you enough for that. We just give you our praise and our, our worship. Just look forward to what's going to be in the rest of our life here, but most of all in our life with you in heaven for eternity. The very phrase eternal life is so incredible. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for this word from the 
in the Word of God. Thank you for this reminder of Christ's sacrifice for us. All of those things, Lord God, we ask you to bless and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Folks, I thank you.